So please welcome Blake to the S4 main stage. Uh, well, thanks, Dale, uh, for that introduction and, and really framing the discussion this morning. Um, I was really excited uh, when I found out D that Dale was inviting uh, Mandiant and FireEye to open this session to kind of set the stage. Um, that is until I got told that I would be the one presenting. Um, then I was a little less excited. Um, but still, it's a great opportunity uh, to share a little bit of what we know uh, about what occurred uh, on the incident where the Triton framework was just, uh, d uh, recovered. Um, so we've shared a lot of this already in our public blog posts, as well as intelligence reports that are available to our Intel clients. Um, but I just wanted to provide uh, some updates, uh, but also some additional detail that I think is relevant to the community here, and some additional focus uh, on a couple areas that I think got lost in, in some of the back and forth. Um, so we'll start with, with a discussion of the sequence of events uh, on the day of the outage that led to the incident being discovered, uh, and then share uh, two new pieces of information or some highlights of existing information, uh, as well as uh, some personal lessons that I took from the incident uh, and takeaways for members of the community in preparing uh, for this type of events, targeting uh, your assets, either as an asset owner or as a vendor who manufactures uh, embedded devices. Um, so to get started, uh, the incident itself, uh, just a brief review, um, the sequence of events. Uh, an operational impact, specifically the failure uh, into a fail-safe mode of two Triconic safety uh, instrumented system controllers uh, within a critical infrastructure facility, uh, triggered an investigation, primarily an operational investigation, an investigation of an outage, not necessarily a, of a cybersecurity incident. Uh, the local triage team who was responding to this, again, engineers and operators from the asset owner, uh, reviewed controller diagnostic logs and did notice that in the period leading up to the outage that some downloads had been performed. Uh, and this is downloads of code, application logic, to a controller from the perspective of the controller, um, something I would sometimes call an upload, but uh, typically that terminology is used in the reverse. Um, in reviewing those logs, they noticed that the source of those downloads was from a legitimate engineering workstation that their engineers or technicians would use to make programming changes to the controller. Uh, but they knew by reviewing their change management documentation that no legitimate changes uh, were intended during that time period. Um, this triggered, of course, then a forensic review of that engineering workstation to help understand uh, what occurred that day that led to application code being downloaded to the targeted controller. Um, those, that led to the recovery of then forensic artifacts from the engineering workstation that contained both the attack script, uh, being the trilog.exe, the py to exe compiled Python script, uh, as well as the libraries, library.zip, which is the communications framework uh, for arbitrary a modification of triconic state. Um, static uh, artifacts on the controller, or excuse me, on the engineering workstation included then also those payload files, uh, and that volatile artifacts, dynamic artifacts of execution on the Windows uh, engineering workstation uh, were what made clear that those scripts were what had been used interactively that day to cause the payload uploads. Um, critically, though, um, we knew the controllers then at that point had been uh, targeted interactively by attackers uh, and that payload files had been used against them. But a review of the controllers itself uh, did not show either of these payloads resident in memory, but did show an additional program present in memory. Uh, so we knew they had been modified in some way and that a payload had been developed. But at this early stage in the investigation, we didn't understand why this payload was no longer present on, uh, on the actual targeted controllers themselves. Uh, but something uh, certainly was. Um, so to help understand why that happened, um, I want to do just a brief overview of the control flow of the Python uploader uh, that was used from that engineering workstation. 
Uh, and then I think this will serve as a great introduction to the detailed discussion of the embedded binary payload uh, that Schneider uh, and, and Reed from Dragos will be discussion, discussing in the follow-up sessions. Um, so this is the graphic that we developed for a public report. You've probably seen this before, just trying to make the distinction between the attack scripts and the trilog.exe executing on the engineering workstation, the framework libraries that it was leveraging, as well as the embedded payloads. Um, and in the next few slides, I'm going to go through uh, some detailed discussion of the control flow of the trilog.exe uploader to discuss why the payload did not persist. And then we can discuss a couple reasons uh, why that might be the case. Um, so a very early stage, uh, one of the first few lines uh, of the attack script, this is the decompiled Python bytecode from trilog.exe. Uh, the malware runs a method, this preset status field, to set four attacker-controlled bytes in a region of memory that corresponds to what's considered the CP status data structure. Uh, the CP status data structure um, was likely used here in this case as almost uh, an echo just to test their ability to read and write memory before going on to deliver uh, the imain.bin uh, memory backdoor. Uh, so critically here, this, this section of code uh, expects a C-style uh, status flag to be set um, based on the return value of this preset status field. Uh, that method itself, its internal implementation, takes those attacker-controlled bytes, uh, inserts some shellcode to write them into memory, and then attempts to read those values back out uh, using legitimate tri-station protocol commands to view the controller status. Um, the important takeaway here uh, is that in the case of success, um, which is reading the same value out of memory that it just wrote into memory, uh, rather than using something uh, like an exception, which might be the more standard way to do this for uh, a Python programmer, uh, they use a C-style uh, integer return value to indicate uh, success or failure. Uh, when this gets passed back um, to the script, uh, it checks the status and sets a flag uh, to perform a restoration function. Um, critically here, at the very end of the code, it checks that flag, and if it has been set, um, overwrites its payload with a small dummy program. Uh, in the ICS cert analysis of, of the code that was recovered, uh, their estimation was that this was intentional, that the attackers wanted their payload to only persist in memory during a limited time frame uh, of, of the attack. And what we see here, some interactive output of what appears on standard out for the attackers running an unmodified version of their code in a lab environment, uh, is it goes through its entire uh, control flow, uh, uploads the actual payload to memory, and then here you see about midway through the screen, it indicates run success, modification success. Um, but because this do restore flag had been set even on success by the return of that preset status field function, uh, even if all of the other further checks in the code indicate success, uh, it then later at the very end of this about six and a half minute back off countdown period, complains that it has failed, and at the very bottom there, you see it force removes its code uh, without checking. So what we know now about the payload is that it itself uh, did not have a cyber physical attack motivation. This specific payload is a generic memory backdoor for read, write, execute capability on the controller. Um, so in, in my estimation, uh, there are two reasons why uh, you might, the attacker might uh, have experienced this behavior where the Python uploader essentially overwrote its own payload. The first is the possibility that ICS cert uh, discussed, which is it was intentional and they only attempted to expose the capability for uh, arbitrary rewrite and execute during the six and a half minute countdown period. Um, the other possibility is that this was a bug. Uh, that the attacker unintentionally, um, by just checking integer values rather than using more expressive uh, control flow techniques like exception handling, um, unintentionally caused themselves uh, to handle a fa failure condition uh, to cover their tracks, uh, even when everything else they had done uh, had been successful. Um, so this is the first of, of a few critical uh, potential mistakes that the attacker made 
that actually prevented, um, even if everything else had worked, uh, completely prevented their payload from persisting in the controllers. Um, so why is this significant? Um, Schneider and Reed will discuss the payload in great detail, but at a high level, it exposes that read-write-execute capability. Um, and during that means that in its current form, as it was recovered, um, you would need to deliver another payload, another attack script that leverages those read, write, or execute capabilities in order to actually cause modification to the logic of the controller or the firmware of the controller uh, to have a sabotage impact, a cyber physical impact to manipulate the operation of the controller. Uh, and what we, there's been a lot of speculation about whether or not there was another payload. Did this other attack uh, script exist? And, uh, a critical new piece of information we're, we can share today is that we can confirm uh, that no such payload uh, was recovered from the day of the outage. So what has been publicly shared uh, is the only sample that was recovered from uh, the, in, the day of the incident that triggered the investigation. Um, and all of our forensic, other forensic artifacts indicate that no other such payload was brought with by the attackers, uh, used or not. Um, it, it's either that they had it and didn't bring it because they experienced this unexpected failure, um, or they simply weren't uh, at a point in the attack lifecycle where they actually had that prepared yet. Um, so what this indicates to us about the state of the attack uh, in an overall attack lifecycle um, is that while well, they had um, gotten to the point where they had a foothold not just within uh, the environment, but specifically within the SIS environment on this engineering workstation, um, but had essentially reached the point of escalating privileges. Uh, they at least believed they had the capability, and Schneider will discuss any potential issues with that capability, but they at least believed they had the capability at this point um, to escalate privilege on the controller, to take what's intended through the tri-station protocol to allow engineers, operators, asset owners to read and write application code uh, and really get to the point where with this in-memory backdoor, allow themselves uh, arbitrary read and write of not just application code, uh, but the full memory space of the Triconics platform. Uh, at least, again, they believe they have that capability. Um, but what does that mean is that, well, just being able to read and write memory um, by in and of itself is not really an attack, certainly not a cyber-physical attack. So their motivation likely would have required, in order to complete their mission, uh, an additional payload in order to have the process impact that they desired. Uh, if their desired impact was simply to stop production at the facility, there was a single command they could have called within that script. They could have written approximately eight lines of code uh, if all they intended to do was stop production. Um, that would have not required the significant investment they made to build this extensible, flexible framework for interacting with these controllers uh, that's quite useful in, in just about any environment where they run. Um, so that means to us, and certainly to me, um, we want this other payload, if it exists. Uh, we're, we're quite curious to see um, if, if this is deployed in other environments or capabilities like this are deployed in other environments uh, to understand the attacker's motivation uh, we really need to understand what that final payload would have been. Um, we want it, and I'm sure all of you do too. So, um, so that's, that's the di deep dive into what we saw in the investigation. Um, we've also performed uh, some research into the actual reverse engineering of the payloads themselves in addition to the uploader, um, but I'm really excited for updates uh, from, from Schneider and Dragos on that front as well. So uh, the, the takeaways, key takeaways for me um, just from the investigation itself. So not specific uh, to attacks against Triconics controllers, but really for me as an incident responder and someone who uh, works primarily in the detection phase and, and response phase to incidents of uh, being on the ground uh, in an area where, this, uh, where we were affected by this, this malware. Um, some of the challenges that we faced originally, and what I'd like to, in addition to all of the remediation advice that's been shared by us, as well as the vendor, ICS, Cert, Dragos, and others, um, evidence preservation was a critical challenge uh, and has the potential to be a critical challenge for uh, embedded uh, incident response and ICS incident response in other cases as well. 
Uh, it's common in incident response plans uh, to address things like forensic capabilities of Windows workstations, Linux uh, servers, um, but make sure that when you're developing an incident response plan, especially as an asset owner, uh, to engage with your vendors for evidence preservation planning for all platforms in your environment, including those embedded platforms. Uh, and consider that forensics of those platforms needs to go beyond static artifacts, such as disk images uh, or being able to read uh, firmware uh, from memory, but also volatile artifacts running memory, uh, for example, from controllers that might lose their application code when they're powered down by design. Um, so make sure you know, next time you're talking to your vendor uh, and going through an incident response planning uh, lifecycle that you understand what the capabilities are of those embedded platforms to expose information about their running memory to you uh, for a forensics use case. Um, the second is just uh, even at a higher level, um, the first people on the ground most likely to respond to an ICS breach are not going to be your cybersecurity incident responders, most likely. Uh, the most likely people to be on the ground uh, are going to be your operators, engineers, potentially vendors, and integrators. Uh, and those people have bias based on their experience and what they've seen before. The normalcy bias is going to tend, when they're investigating an incident or even a failure, to understand it as something that they've seen before or understand well. Um, it's important to make sure that those people who are in the positions who are most likely to notice things that may trigger an investigation of an event as a cybersecurity incident, um, to be encouraged to question some of their maybe biases about uh, the likely origin of behavior in the environment, and at least consider, not necessarily as the most likely outcome or, or, or what's necessarily common, but at least as a possibility. Um, that cybersecurity attacks against these systems can be the root cause of operational incidents. Um, but the good news is, is that it really just takes one person um, from, uh, who's involved in triage to be able to, to raise their hand and say, we need to dig a little deeper. Um, uh, and really the implication of this, and, and going back to what I mentioned about evidence preservation on the last slide, um, is even if you do begin an investigation of an event as a potential cybersecurity incident, uh, there is a risk of underscoping. For example, focusing only on the components that failed or experienced impact, uh, rather than taking uh, that uh, failure or impact that was experienced as a signal to investigate a broader concern. Um, it, it's part of our incident response me methodology at Mandiant to go, to go wide before we go deep. Um, because uh, by un the risk in underscoping an incident is that you miss uh, critical information that might give you an opportunity uh, to, to learn, to learn more about your environment and your systems, learn more about uh, security architecture that would be effective to protecting your environment, but, but very, very critically, you might miss the opportunity uh, to disrupt the attacker left of Boom earlier in their attack life cycle before they complete their mission um, if you were to unfortunately, for example, uh, underscope an investigation and, and destroy critical evidence in the process of uh, restoring operations. So, um, yeah. yeah.